Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Two surprising exits of popular TV hosts and one CEO, all in less than 24 hours. Who's leaving and what we know so far about why. A lawyer for Hunter Biden pushes back against a former Trump aide and Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. He's accusing both of them of wrongdoing with regard to the president's son. What's happening at the southern border and where it's expected to go from here? We'll bring you a national security expert's take. America sends its special forces to Sudan to evacuate people from the U.S. Embassy. What is the U.S. doing to help evacuate the thousands of American citizens who didn't work at the embassy? And the Chinese ambassador to France takes heat for a controversial comment. Find out what he said about former Soviet republics and how various nations are responding. Two major departures in the news industry. Fox News is parting ways with primetime host Tucker Carlson, while CNN fires host Don Lemon. NTD's Iris Tao brings us more. And Tucker Carlson now out at Fox News. The network confirmed it on Monday morning, saying it's parting ways with its primetime host, whose show had been among the most popular in all of cable television, averaging more than 3 million viewers per episode. Here's Fox News' Harris Faulkner announcing it on air. Watch. We want to thank Tucker Carlson for his service to the network as a host and prior to that as a long-term contributor. In a statement, Fox News says Carlson's last show was on last Friday, but Carlson didn't seem to know that, or at least not on air. He said this at the end of his Friday show. And we'll be back on Monday. In the meantime, have the best weekend with the ones that you love, and we'll see you then. The New York Times, citing two unnamed sources, says Carlson was only informed of the change Monday morning. And now some conservative politicians and commentators are applauding Carlson's work. But some liberal lawmakers cheer the fact that Carlson no longer has a primetime platform. All this as Don Lemon, a primetime anchor for CNN, announced on the same day that he had been terminated without having spoken to CNN management. Meanwhile, CNN is now calling Lemon's claim inaccurate, saying he was offered an opportunity to meet with management. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. And a lawyer for Hunter Biden is accusing multiple conservatives of wrongdoing with regard to the president's son. This just days after allegations that President Biden's campaign covered up the laptop story. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the latest. Hunter Biden attorney Abby Lowell is going on the offense to defend the president's son. He sent a letter about Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene to the House Oversight Committee on Monday. Lowell calls Greene's statements about Hunter Biden a spray of shotgun pellets of personal vitriol. The letter also links videos in which the Congresswoman talked about Hunter Biden. He was engaged in an actual human trafficking ring and he was paying a lot of money for it. Lowell says Green's allegations aren't ethical and that none of these could possibly be deemed to be part of any legitimate legislative activity. After the letter was sent on Monday, Green tweeted that the entire government has proof Hunter Biden was involved in human sex trafficking and they have done absolutely nothing about it. But just imagine if Hunter's last name was Trump. Meanwhile, on Monday, Lowell also sent a letter to the Treasury Department's Office of Inspector General. He says that former Trump White House aide Garrett Ziegler published five suspicious activity reports related to Hunter Biden. Unauthorized disclosure of such reports can be prosecuted. These two letters come just days after allegations came out of President Biden's campaign covering up the Hunter Biden laptop story. The campaign at the time dismissed the laptop story as Russian disinformation. Republican Senator Ron Johnson on Sunday said they wrote a letter to interfere in our election to a far greater extent than anything China or Russia could ever hope to do. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is in Japan today. The potential Republican candidate spoke about the 2024 presidential election ahead of a meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister. I'm not, I'm not a candidate, so we'll see if, uh, if and when that changes. And I know many Floridians, and certainly my wife and I, we have great regard for the Japanese people, uh, Japanese culture, and really appreciate what a great ally Japan has been to the United States over many, many decades. 
And so we're, we're excited to be here to be able to explore more relations with Florida and Japan. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida told DeSantis that Florida is one of the fastest growing states in the U.S. and that he's pleased that many Japanese enterprises are flourishing there. The trip to Japan is part of a four-country trade mission. Some see it as an attempt by DeSantis to beef up his foreign policy credentials ahead of an official announcement that he will run for president in 2024. The Florida governor will head to South Korea, Israel and Britain after leaving Japan. And thousands of migrants are now flocking north through Mexico, protesting immigration detention centers along the way. There's 3,000 people in this latest caravan, which is incidentally the same number of Border Patrol agents House Republicans aim to hire with a new bill this week. Here's NTD's Melina Wisecup with the latest on the border crisis. A mass protest flooding the streets of Tapachula near the Guatemalan border, demanding an end of detention centers like the one that migrants set on fire last month, killing 40. The bloodshed demands justice. For this reason, we walk. Let's go. Calling it a mass protest procession, the migrants set out on Sunday by foot, hoping to reach Mexico City in 10 days, with the ultimate goal for some being to reach the U.S. Where all of us want the United States to fight for a better future for my daughter here and another one I left in Honduras. Most of them are Venezuelans, but authorities say some of them are from China and other Asian countries. But House Republicans are now trying to restrict the use of the CBP-1 app. The goal here is to prevent migrants from being able to use this app to schedule appointments at the border where they can then make their asylum claims. That's just one proposal that's included in the House Republicans recently announced border security package. This package also aims to restart construction of the border wall. Meanwhile, other lawmakers are turning their focus to illegal immigrants who are currently here in the states. Here's the proposal that House Democrat Congressman Lou Correa recently explained to us. Anybody who's come into the country before 2015 can apply for change in status. Again, it's about a seven year lag, so that means anybody who's been here for at least seven, eight years. The number of people taking the trip, around 3,000. That's also about how many Border Patrol agents the House GOP plans to hire, as presented in their new border security package. That's another proposal that's highly unlikely to garner support from both sides of the aisle. And instead of having a system of dialogue and compromise to try to reach consensus. We sit around throwing bombs at each other and as a result, nothing gets done. House Republicans do aim to push this border security package through committee this week, and this has been a top priority for House Republicans. But considering the political polarization of this issue, as well as just the current makeup of the Democrat controlled Senate, it will be tough for Republicans to push through any border security or immigration related package through the finish line during this Congress. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And next, discussing his insights on the border, author and senior national security fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies, Todd Benzman. He was at the southern border recently, and I spoke with him earlier today. Todd, welcome. Thanks for coming on again. Now, you recently returned from the southern border. Can you tell us what you saw down there and what's your sense of the state of things down there? Sure. I went to Juarez. I spent four days in the city right across from El Paso. That's the big Mexican city there. And uh, what's happening there is that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, immigrants every single day are arriving by freight train into the city from all parts of uh, the world, coming through Tapachula in the southern part of Mexico. And they're coming because uh, they, for two reasons. One is that they have heard correctly that the Americans are now letting them in uh, to the United States on humanitarian permission slips if they cross illegally. Uh, these would be Venezuelans who previously uh, were told you can't come in this way. You have to apply on this CBP-1 app for you know a humanitarian parole. Uh, and if you try to come in over the border, then we will bar you for life for using that. And they're neither barring them for life uh, nor anything else. They're just letting a great many of them into New Jersey and New York and Washington and Chicago and then denying it. Uh, but 
by denying it, they're not turning off any of these immigrants because they have cell phones and their cell phones are in communication with all the people in New Jersey who just got in this way. And so there is this mad rush to start, uh, you know, uh, abandoning CBP-1 and crossing in the old fashioned way. And it's working. And in addition to that, you're expecting to see a tidal wave of illegal immigration come the end of Title 42. So what exactly are, are you predicting? Well, uh, as I wrote in the New York Post piece, the replacement plan for Title 42 is something called Title 8 expedited removal uh, with a few bells and whistle things on it. Uh, but the bells and whistles are essentially loopholes and workarounds and in runs, every one of them. And for that reason, I predict that we will have a really significant flood of unaccompanied minors who are exempt from the new plan completely. We're taking them all in, uh, and it says so. Uh, families with uh, small children uh, will no longer be uh, subject to Title 42. They'll get right in under the Flores loophole. Look it up, Flores settlement, uh, Google that. That that is a uh, it's a court order from 20 years ago that says we can't hold families for longer than 20 days. They all get in and everybody else just has to say, I'm afraid to go back to Mexico and they get in or else they can appeal and appeal till the cows come home and then they get in. So uh, for those reasons, I predict that we will see a very significant surge at the physical border which is, and so does the Mayorkas uh, DHS, because they are surging aircraft, buses, uh, human resources, uh, really, you know, material, uh, National Guard, everything to facilitate the quicker, uh, the, the, a, a very quick entry into the United States of all these masses of people so that they don't build up for the TV cameras. And Todd, do you, do you expect this, what's happening at the border right now to affect the campaigns leading up to the 2024 presidential election? Well, I think as, as more millions of people come in, it is likely to affect the fortunes of the Democrats uh, more than the midterms did because there were only 4 million people in. Uh, by, the, by the 2024, we should have 8 million people in. Uh, and that's going to be felt a little bit more. And I don't think they're going to be able to be successful in uh, not creating large encampments and, uh, you know, uh, aggregations of humanity down there at the border that will attract international media attention either. Try as they might to move them all into the interior as fast as possible. It's not going to work, I don't think. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Todd Bensman, Senior National Security Fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies and author of the new book, Overrun, How Joe Biden Unleashed the Greatest Border Crisis in U.S. History. Really appreciate it. Thank you. The former Minnesota police officer who killed Dante Wright was released from prison today. Kimberly Potter served 16 months of her two-year sentence for fatally shooting the unarmed 20-year-old during a 2021 traffic stop. She has said she mistook her gun for a taser. During her trial, Potter apologized, saying she never meant to hurt anyone. Potter is now on supervised release until December when her sentence expires. Her attorney says she's planning to live in Wisconsin and not return to Minnesota. Over the weekend, the United States sent special forces into Sudan to help evacuate about 100 people from the U.S. Embassy. Several other countries have also been evacuating their citizens as intense fighting continues in Sudan. NTD's Jason Perry gives us that update. A decision to suspend operations at the embassy, remove our personnel from their assigned posts, is among the most difficult that any secretary has to make. But my first priority is the safety of our people. On Saturday, the United States sent special forces to evacuate U.S. government personnel and their dependents from the U.S. Embassy in Sudan. The U.S. military used helicopters that flew from a base in Djibouti, about 750 miles from Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, where the embassy is located, and also where most of the fighting is going on. 
Monday is the 10th day of intense battles between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the paramilitary group called the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF. The two groups have a disagreement about when the RSF should integrate into the Sudanese Armed Forces, which would cause the RSF to lose much of the power it currently has. We've also continued to engage directly with General Burhan and General Hamedi to press them to extend and expand the Eid ceasefire to a sustainable cessation of hostilities that prevents further violence and upholds humanitarian obligations. But after agreeing to multiple ceasefires, both sides have not stopped fighting for very long. So far, over 420 people, including 264 civilians, have been killed and over 3,700 wounded in the fighting between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the RSF. Several other countries have also been evacuating people. Among them are Germany, which says it flew out 311 people so far. Italy says it flew out more than 100 evacuees. South Korea said it evacuated 28 of its citizens. And evacuations are also being done by sea. A Saudi Arabian ship evacuated 199 people from Sudan. Sudan residents have fled the country not only by air and sea, but also by land. Several buses were seen crossing into Egypt early Monday. After first saying Americans should not expect a government-coordinated evacuation, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan outlined a change in plans. At the president's direction, we are actively facilitating the departure of American citizens who want to leave Sudan, as the State Department has been urging them to do for years. We have deployed U.S. intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets to support land evacuation routes, which Americans are using, and we're moving naval assets within the region to provide support. American citizens have begun arriving in Port Sudan, and we are helping to facilitate their onward travel. Jason Perry, NTD News. And turning to international politics around Ukraine. A Chinese ambassador is taking heat for a comment he made, and tensions are rising in the United Nations with Russia at the head of the Security Council. The Chinese Communist regime's ambassador to France, Lu Shaye, caused an uproar over the weekend when he suggested that former members of the Soviet Union are not sovereign nations. This includes nations like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, as well as Ukraine, and a handful of Central Asian countries, among others. Speaking on French TV, the ambassador said, quote, Even these ex-Soviet countries don't have an effective status in international law, because there was no international agreement to materialize their status as sovereign countries. The Chinese ambassador was responding to a question about whether Crimea is part of Ukraine. European nations, including France, Ukraine, and former Soviet republics, have criticized the comments and asked for clarification. The Chinese regime on Monday tried to distance itself from Liu's comments. China's position on relevant issues has remained unchanged. About the issue of territory and sovereignty, China's position is consistent and clear. Tensions are also rising in the United Nations over the issue of Ukraine. The Russian foreign minister chaired the meeting of the UN Security Council on Monday, as Russia holds the monthly rotating presidency of the Council for April. In his speech, the Russian diplomat said, As was the case in the Cold War, we have reached a dangerous, possibly even more dangerous threshold. The situation has been worsened by the loss of trust in multilateralism. The UN Secretary General, who was seated next to the Russian Foreign Minister during the meeting, condemned Russia for the war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, in violation of the United Nations Charter and international law, is causing massive suffering and devastation to the country and its people. At the same Security Council meeting, the sister of Paul Whelan, a former U.S. Marine jailed in Russia, called on Russia to release her brother. Russia's less than sophisticated take on diplomacy is to arbitrarily detain American citizens in order to extract concessions from the United States. This is not the work of a mature and responsible nation. It is the action of a terrorist state. And I am here to tell Russia, free Paul Whelan. Russia and the U.N. are now working to discuss details of a Black Sea grain export deal. Russia has signaled that it will not allow the deal to continue beyond May 18th, while the U.N. Secretary General urged the deal to continue. 
China's ambassador to the UN also said China would like to see the Ukraine grain deal continue. China is the largest recipient of grains from Ukraine under the export deal. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Coming up, a stunning trade in the NFL has suddenly transformed the New York Jets from playoff doormats to Super Bowl contenders. And a spiritual group in California is commemorating the anniversary of a peaceful appeal in China. They still face persecution 20 years later. Stay tuned for more after this short break. Henry Repeating Arms manufactures a line of classic American-made rifles and shotguns. With over 200 models to choose from and a wide variety of finishes and calibers, there's a Henry that's right for you. Every purchase is backed by our lifetime warranty and award-winning customer service. We invite you to order a copy of our free catalog and decals. Simply call the number on your screen or visit HenryUSA.com. That's HenryUSA.com. Miss NTD, the first NTD global Chinese beauty pageant. Miss NTD, gold award $10,000. Now to sports news, here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred said today he felt sorry for the fans in Oakland regarding the team's now impending move to Las Vegas. He also denied claims by Oakland's mayor that the team was using their negotiations as leverage to getting a new stadium built in Nevada. Last week, the A's announced plans to purchase land for a new retractable roof ballpark near the Vegas Strip that could be ready by 2027. This came after failed negotiations to build a new stadium in the Bay Area. Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao said, quote, It is clear to me that the A's have no intention of staying in Oakland and have simply been using this process to try to extract a better deal out of Las Vegas. Manfred disputed that, though, saying owner John Fisher negotiated exclusively with Oakland for years before looking elsewhere. As for the deal with Vegas, there are no specifics on the financials except that it will be a public-private partnership. The A's have been in Oakland since 1968. Meanwhile, Forbes magazine recently valued the franchise at just under $1.2 billion. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, plenty of playoff action. First in the NBA, a couple of game fours as Miami already up 2-1, host Milwaukee, which may still be without the injured Giannis Antetokounmpo. And in LA, the Lakers look to take a commanding 3-1 lead as they face Memphis. And for you hockey fans, another quadruple header of game fours tonight. First in New York, the Rangers host New Jersey looking to take a 3-1 lead. And in Tampa Bay, the Lightning face the Maple Leafs trailing 2-1. In the later games, Vegas plays at Winnipeg as the Jets need a win to even the series at 2. And in Seattle, the Avalanche look to take a 3-1 lead on the road against the Kraken. And finally for you baseball fans, 11 games tonight including the Tampa Bay Rays who had 19-3 of the league's best record and are a perfect 13-0 at home. They host the defending World Series champion Houston Astros. And that is it for your sports news today. Steph, back to you. Thanks, Dave. And breaking news from the NFL, as the Green Bay Packers are trading four-time MVP Aaron Rodgers to the New York Jets, according to multiple reports. New York will send Green Bay multiple draft picks in return. The news comes six weeks after Rodgers declared on the Pat McAfee show that he intended to play for the Jets in the upcoming season. And lastly, tomorrow is the 24th anniversary of a spiritual practice's peaceful appeal in China. Over the weekend, Californians commemorated the day by raising awareness of the group's persecution under China's communist regime. NTD's Jason Blair has that story. 
Here in San Francisco, practitioners of Falun Dafa are commemorating a peaceful appeal made in 1999 when the Chinese Communist Party first started persecuting the practice in China. On April 25, 1999, about 10,000 Falun Dafa practitioners stood outside of a government office in Beijing, China, to peacefully call on the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, to end the harassment and suppression of their peers. CCP's police will try to arrest the Falun Dafa practitioners. And that's when they try to go to this police department and they will say, oh, you got to go to such office to do this and such office to do that. And eventually they went to the Beijing Zhongnan High, that office, the government office. The practitioners appealed for three things, a free environment to practice their faith, the release of 45 Falun Dafa practitioners who were detained in the city of Tianjin at the time, and for all Falun Gong books to be legal in China. That appeal has not been forgotten even overseas 24 years later. Fearing the growing popularity, the CCP began cracking down on the practice nationwide in July 1999. The police in the labor camp, uh, they put uh, you know cold water, uh, you know those uh, crazy cold water on uh, to just uh, people, you know. So and they also don't like people to eat, and uh, they don't like the people to sleep. So my uh, so my dad was in the labor camp, uh, and then uh, caused him uh, also like uh, some uh, house issue after he got out. When Wei's father was released, his whole family was put under surveillance. Wei left China via a student visa and hasn't been back to see his family in four years. Despite the brutal persecution, people still choose to keep practicing because it brought many benefits. Falun Gong gained popularity during the 1990s. It features the core principles of truthfulness, compassion and tolerance, along with meditative exercises. On Sunday night, Falun Dafa practitioners gathered outside of the San Francisco Chinese consulate for a candlelight vigil to commemorate those who died for their belief. We are really speak up for the, the, the one that they kind of speak up in China right now. And, you know, we're just standing here holding the banner to let the people go pass by and the traffic so they see what's going on. Yeah. Similarly, Los Angeles practitioners held an event at the L.A. Chinese consulate. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.